Okay. So highly anticipated for this one here. Um, so we have a very important guest today. And actually, some of my colleagues are saying that uh, this could very well be one of the most critical podcasts of our current times. That is, if, if you're involved in financial services, uh, particularly life insurance and lead generation. So we'll get into all that in a minute. But uh, first, I want to introduce our guest. Eric J. Troutman, founder of Troutman Amin LLP, regularly published in the National Law Review, known as one of the country's prominent class action defense lawyers, nationally recognized in TCPA, national TCPA class actions, litigated nearly a thousand individual TCPA cases. TCPA world, so he's known as the czar of the TCPA world. I think I'm going to ask you about that one too. I like the naming. So... Involved in litigation, uh, multi-billion dollar telecommunications class actions in federal court. Uh, he's reps for institutions facing uh, individual TCPA matters, built one of the country's first TCPA uh, only defense teams, serves as national TCPA counsel, uh, works with in-house compliance counsel. That's, that's interesting to me. Uh, performs TCPA audits, uh, an avid blogger and speaker at the forefront of the industry's effort to push for clarity in these TCPA matters. There's actually a plug I want to put in for Lead Generation World. Uh, you're, you're, you're partner with them as well, it seems. And that's actually where I come to learn about you myself. REACH, founder and president, REACH. I, I like that organization. Responsible Enterprises Against Consumer Harassment. Uh, so this is what I found with, with my research. This is web search, right? So um, I think I did read the true romantic in there somewhere. We, we don't have to go down, down that road yet. But uh, so, yeah, what, uh, what can we learn about Eric Troutman uh, without using the web? What, what else might we need to know? Well, first of all, hey, folks, uh, it's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty unidimensional, right? I, I am exactly what you see on the Internet. Uh, from a professional standpoint, of course, I am an attorney uh, of some renown, uh, and I'm trying to use my platform as one of the best known telecom lawyers in the entire world uh, to keep folks informed, right? Uh, and not just take money off of people, uh, but really try to give as much as I can from an information standpoint to really keep people informed. So tcpaworld.com, which you've mentioned, right? That's my blog. That's where I break down every single case every single day, totally free, no barriers. You don't have to sign up. You can just go anytime you want and, and get free information. Uh, and of course, REACH, which you've mentioned, uh, that is kind of my effort uh, with other good organizations uh, in the space to clean up unwanted calls. Uh, on the one hand, I defend companies that are trying to be compliant with the law. And there's a lot of extortionist right, litigators out there that are, are picking on people. I love to defend businesses, both small and big, against those lawsuits. But on the other hand, right, we all know that there's abuses out there where consumers are being harassed by phone calls that shouldn't be made. Uh, and so REACH is our effort to have the businesses self-police, um, out the bad guys, you know, take care of the good guys and create a, an ecosystem of, that, that's very positive uh, with consumer-friendly policies and companies. And that aligns well with what we do. If you learn more about what we've been working on, especially heavily the last two years, that aligns perfectly. We, we feel the same. And, you know, us being uh, in the financial services industry, so I, I'm a licensed financial advisor myself. But somewhere along this way, I, I run really deeply into the lead generation side as well. I started building programs. We've built two different programs now, specifically one. We were ahead of the rulings when it comes to consent. So we were already doing that. The other program itself, uh, it's, it's hard to go deeper into it right now, but it's attempted to be copied right now. So it's it's really neat to us because we've, we've put this, that information out there and there's a legal component that you would understand quite well to it and how it fits the compliance. But the fact that uh, it's trying to be copied by one of the largest organizations, uh, they're to put it simply, they're out on a treasure hunt with only half the map. So we, we're, we're, we're in watch of that right now, too. So that's another conversation that we'll see how this develops that we'll have in another time, too. I think you're going to appreciate that one. So, uh, of course, these, these rulings affect us. Uh, insurance, uh, financial services, but especially the insurance because it's more outgoing calls with that. And, and of course, lead generation. So, so what I want to do today 
is uh, give some insights of what I witness in the in the life insurance industry to kind of see if you're well averse in there, but maybe there's something that I've seen that maybe uh, helps direct why I'm asking specific questions today. But uh, but but I really like for you to tell us what these mean to four different specific entities. That the way I've broken it down: one at the agent and broker level. So agents and brokers, what does this mean for them? How they need to adjust? What they need to know? Uh, the IMO level, the the FMOs, the BGAs. What does this mean at that level? Of course, the carriers. We speak directly with many carriers with our programs, so I we we've, I can share some good information there. What what they do uh, and how it might affect them. But then, of course, the lead generators as well. And there's quite a bit of overlap in the uh, the IMO agency level as with the lead generation level because some of these IMOs provide that lead generation to their agents. So there's an overlapping factor there that we'll get into as well. But first I wanted to, I wrote something on this to get you started uh, to see how you respond and how, how uh, where this conversation would go from this right here. So, so data being the new oil, I'm sure everyone's heard that. I'm sure you've heard this report too. So would data be the new oil? So the war on oil, this has been going on for decades, but now we're in the data war and i think we're just in the infancy of it right so aside from the war on information and i see the overlap there with the data war and war on information but uh in today's topics and how they relate to this uh you know financial services life insurance lead generation there's two major negative impacts we'll say uh number one and i'll go ahead and break the swear barrier for you uh it's what i call shit data it's uh it's garbage uh the on our website, we polish it up and call it waste management, but it's your cheap data leads, right? So we'll get into that. They're regurgitated, resold, redistributed. Um, I'm sure you've seen this time and time again, but we're going to talk into that. Uh, but because it's cheap, it's appealing to our agents. And this kind of sets the tone leading to the next negative impact, the second negative impact. Uh, consumers getting flooded with the endless calls. You know, it's and now text messages are, are in that flooding as well. So uh, who, who's responsible for these negative impacts? We say both parties. Both parties should take responsibility. Number one, the data vendors, they call themselves lead generators, lead vendors. Which we we kind of start to recall them as data brokers. They're just they're data brokers. So but they make mega margins on the resale of this data. Uh, you know, there's no operating cost. Uh, they know much of their data is garbage so they're taking advantage of the thirsty agents who, who need people to call and with no incentive to stop you know really no way to catch them unless you take the length we did i published a video on my experience chasing down the these leads and where they came from and i'll i'll share that with you uh at some point too and you can find it on our channel that's probably a popular video to, to get a hold to because I share the entire experience, how I use my software engineer to assist me in digging out permalinks. And we found the, the true marketing that was going on and it was, it was a highly unethical practice. So there's a video out there for that I can show you. But anyway, number two, the agents have, they seemingly have no remorse for blowing up people on the phone anymore. You know, they're, they're, they know they're doing this. It's inundation of phone calls, but they're, they're pissing off the innocent public, right? So these people didn't ask for this. So we, we take a stand against that as well. You know, my mother visits and her phone rings constantly while she's at the house. And she doesn't even bother to answer it anymore because it's so inundated. Like I said, it's getting flooded. So we, I don't feel sorry for either party, honestly. I believe both can do better. I think a pivot is necessary. So uh, with these rulings, I'm, I'm not really angry. I say December 13th was kind of an early Christmas present for us. So... How, how does that get you started and what are your thoughts on, on a take like that? Well, I think, um, I mean, everything you just said aligns with reach, right? And, and okay. so let's go back to the beginning, right? And you, you have good instincts here because it, it, you really can't tell a story without understanding where we all came from, yeah. um, which was, you know, two years ago, three years ago, the lead generation industry was running completely amok. There was absolutely no standards. Um, there was no attempt to self-regulate. It was a race to the bottom. Everyone was just looking at what everybody else was doing and saying, well, they're getting away with it, so I'm gonna do it. And you know what? I'm gonna find a way to reduce even more friction in the funnel by basically doing something even sleazier from a data perspective. And then you're right, the callers would get a hold of the data and they would just hammer it. And there was no one telling them that they ought to slow down. And you know, the concept was, hey, look, we've got express written consent, so none of the rules apply to us. Um, and that was a real problem. And my law firm, Troutman Amin LLP, started attending all these shows, uh, LeadsCon and, and Lead Generation World. 
uh, and all the, the shows that we could find where these lead generators were present. And we represented the big brands, right? The big direct consumer marketers who were buying all the leads, ingesting all this risk, because if you correctly pointed out, the data sets were not good in many instances. I mean, sometimes they were. It's not like they were right. completely garbage, but right. in many instances, they weren't good. It was leading to lawsuits. Uh, and I realized pretty early on that, man, if I didn't get out there and look these guys in the eye and say, stop selling my clients junk, they were just going to keep on doing it. And it was really hard because, you know, the marketing folks at the brands, right, they've got relationships with these guys and they're just like buying the stuff and no one's really betting anything. It's, it's crazy. It's madness the way this was working out. Um, so for uh, over a year, I, I worked with the trade organization that existed at the time in the, in the trade, in the, uh, the lead gen world. And I realized you know, these guys, they're not serious. They don't want change. They're not, they're not really trying to clean things up. You know, it's just lip service. Uh, so I created reach, you know, directly to respond to these issues that you're identifying one, getting rid of fraud out there, getting data sets that make sense, putting together standards for what a web form submission should actually look like. So that lead buyer that relies on a reach generated lead knows that they're going to get a quality consumer that really wants to hear from them, right? Which is really what this whole thing's supposed to be about. Um, and then setting standards for the lead buyers as well, saying, look, you know, you're going to get a quality lead. So don't hammer it, man. There's no need to call that person 10 times a day. Just shoot them a text. They'll get back Thank to you, you, right? This whole That's what this whole thing is. Um, so that was the mission of reach. But right at the same time, and truthfully, maybe because of my efforts with Reach and my publicity that I was doing on TCPA World talking about these issues, uh, the FCC initiated a, what's called a, a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, to look at closing what they called the lead generator loophole. Because all of these abuses that we were just talking through, um, the FCC began to become much more informed of this. And for many years, understand you know, the, the government had no idea that the lead generation industry even existed. They had no clue about this industry. It was totally unregulated. It was completely under the radar. Uh, and so people were like pulling their hair out thinking, how do we stop robocalls? And no one realized that like so many of the robocalls were coming because people would fill out one form on a website mm -hmm. and their lead would get sold a thousand times over a five year period with no one telling them to stop. And there was no rules around that. And you're right, hungry agents, thirsty agents, man, we're paying pennies for data with a lead that was generated four years ago. The guy's not even in the market, but hey, it is you know. lucrative. I hate to interrupt you, but it's very lucrative to the data vendor. You know, it, they generate it one time, that's their marketing cost. And then when it's resold again and again, it's 100% margin from there. I it's get free it. Money, it's, man. it's free money. And, and they, you know, from their perspective, and the messed up thing is it was probably legal. Right. I, I mean, it, like no rule was being broken as long as they weren't lying. Right. They're selling you a lead. Oh, this was 100 percent, you know, TCPA compliant opt in. And if you're dumb enough to buy it without asking, well, when was it generated? Um, you know, there's no there's no fraud there. Uh, if it's a real lead, even if it's five years old. Right. You're paying for it. And they don't know any better. You're right. You're they don't know any enough. better. Um, so anyway, the commission you know, got a hold of all these abuses and they decided look, something needed to be done. Uh, and so going back to February of 2023. So a year ago, uh, they put out a, a, a proposal basically saying, we're going to close, we're going to end lead generation. We're going to say that you cannot transfer an online consent form at all. And so all of a sudden reach, which was designed primarily for self-regulation and for setting standards in the industry, kind of had to go into turbo drive to save the industry all of a sudden, right? Which was not what we were created, but we became like the number one advocacy right. arm of the industry because you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater isn't a good idea either, right? Yes, there was abuses, but wait a second, lead generation is critical for small business. It's a superpower of our economy. Exactly. So many people rely on this and it is good for the consumer, right? The consumer gets to be connected with a small company, you know, in their that's geographic right. area that can meet their specific needs. That's not bad. That's not a bad that's thing. That's right. And, and let me throw this in too, especially in life insurance, because, you know, look at every study in any life insurance agent would tell you, any financial service person, uh, professional would tell you, the, it's outbound. They're not calling in. We don't have people lining up at the door outside of our agencies to come get life insurance and financial services. We have right. to go get them. So that component, I get it's there. I completely understand it. You know, my, my fight is against, you know, the inundation we're talking about. So Reach, you know, worked with the commission and the commission uh, has a, a group called the Small Business Administration and we worked through them. Uh, and although I think the FCC was really leaning heavily towards shutting down the entire industry, like they just really didn't understand initially right. what the benefit of it was. Uh, by the time Reach got done, 
uh, you know, the commission, uh, you know, said, look, we understand the value of lead generation. We understand the value of, of comparison shopping. Um, but we are going to it, it require a one to one rule. And what that means is that that consumer is going to have to be given a specific seller, a specific brand that that consumer is willing to hear from. The consumer has to choose which brand they want to hear from. Now, the website operator can have multiple brands yep. and the consumer can, list, can can pick more than one, but they have to be selected one at a time. Uh, and the really tricky part of this whole thing is, is that, as I just said, it has to be the brand. It has to be the seller, right? Sure. The, the, the provider of the good or service. And here that word seller is confusing because we're not talking about the lead seller. Yep. We're not even talking about the, the insurance product seller, the agent or the broker. We're talking about the seller being the ultimate provider of the good or service, right? The actual carrier is the seller here. Okay. So as as worded, right? In order for you know an agent to be able to sell a carrier's product, going all the way down to the lead generator level, right? That form has to include the word you know, or that the uh, a checkbox, right, next to that carrier. And again, there could be four carriers listed. Um, but whichever one the, the consumer hears from, that lead is now valid only for those carriers. And if it gets sold over to an agent, agent buys that, agent has to be aware. Agent can only sell those carriers. You can't be a broker. You can't try to sell something else. It has to be only one of those carriers that that consumer has accepted, um, which is a very, very big change. It's very challenging for the broker model, right, where you can imagine a form where the consumer only wants to hear from one carrier. And you're a broker and you're supposed to find that that cus customer the best, right, the right yeah. policy for them, but they only want to hear about one. And so you can't talk about any of the others, right? How can you do That's your right. job? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a very challenging circumstance that the commission has put us into. And I don't think that they understood what they were doing. So the other piece of good news, and we can unpack it just a little bit more. Right. But the other piece of good news is that. Again, through Reach's efforts, um, we we convinced the FCC that they did not receive enough comment from small businesses. They didn't look enough at the impact on small business before they adopted their rule. Uh, and so the commission reopened the comment period just to hear from small businesses about the impact of the rule uh, until Mar uh, February 26th. So that, that comment window just closed. It closed February 26th. Uh, but a lot of small businesses just did come forward. Reach came forward with an additional comment. Uh, there was a lot of, okay. of really good traction now in the record kind of explaining why this rule is going to be really damaging for small business. And we gave some, I think, very tangible ways that the commission could roll it back to some degree uh, and protect consumers still. You know, one example is what I just said, rather than have the word seller in there, which is very confusing and really only requires the carriers to be listed, if you just replace that word with entity, uh, then you could have the agent's name or the broker's name listed Right. And the consumer could hear from them instead of just having to hear from one or two uh, carriers, That's right. uh, which is not good for the consumer. Yeah. And that in that example, exactly uh, is how we set up for our, you know, our lead generation software where the, the form itself. Uh, it gives what I call it the branding umbrella. So if you're part of that branding umbrella, you can be a part of that brand and then you can be distributing to multiple agents. It doesn't matter because they can't control which agent under your brand that you pass the lead to, right? These agents, uh, and myself included, we're independents. We don't work for one carrier. We don't represent right. one carrier. Yeah. So as long as we leave carrier out of the marketing altogether and we brand our agency tie only, then we still have the ability to reach to multiple carriers. Is that correct? I mean, currently, no. Once the one-to-one -one rule becomes the law, that model you just described, it's, it's dead. It can't work. And that's a problem, right? The commission did not think about that because, you know, take a look at the branding umbrella, right? Let's say the branding umbrella is for, is for you know, red company. Um, and everybody in the branding umbrella is Red Company, but the carrier is the one that's actually providing the product, right? Red Company doesn't provide the product. They're just providing a finding service, trying to connect that consumer with the carrier. Um, so one way that you could do it is you could try to revamp the whole thing and say, no, 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 no. Red Company is providing the service. The service is finding the right product for the consumer. Exactly. That is the service, right? Uh, but then that has to be the call to action to the consumer. It can't be 
you know, it sign is. up. We call it advisor. Right. Request an advisor is what we call it. Exactly. Call that's exactly right. So that's, that's the it. model. Now, even that yeah. is dangerous, right? Because now you have to have the consumer essentially sign up for your advisory service before signing up, you know, obtaining any carrier products. So it's like a two-step yep. dance. Uh, and we can still expect the plaintiff's bar is going to challenge that and say, really? yeah, you know, the advisory service is nonsense. Really, it's still just, you know, they're just here for insurance and the insurance That's company the carrier is, is, the, is the good service provider. Now, again, Reach's comment out there to the commission highlights this exact issue very specifically and says, look, commission, there's no reason why, uh, uh, you know, the, the consumer shouldn't be able to hear from from Red's and it has to only hear from one specific carrier. The entire reason the consumer is coming into the comparison shopping landscape is because they don't know that's which right. carrier is best for them, right? That's and our so job. You, yep. that, that's their job, right? And so the FCC, like you are literally stripping away the number one benefit of comparison shopping, stripping away the number one benefit uh, of the advisory service uh, by forcing arbitrarily that consumer to make a decision before they're empowered and educated to make that decision. Uh, and that's a real problem. I don't think that's what the FCC yes. was trying to do, but that is the reason. Right. It's an implication. That's right. Uh, are any insurance carriers, the big carriers, doing anything that you know of? Are they involved? Um, U.S. Health Group uh, has done comments in the past. They are tied into this. Uh, that is the only carrier network I'm aware of that's, that's lifting a finger. Uh, AmeriLife is participating with Reach. They're not a carrier, of course, um, but they are But they are assisting um, in the efforts. Uh, but that's about it, man. The, the carriers wow. and, and the IMOs and, and most of these companies, they, they've really missed the bus on this to some degree. And look, it is what it is. I mean, everyone's going to be living under the same rules. And that's, I think, you know, zooming out again, that's kind of part of the hesitance of many of these companies is they think, yeah. well, look, this is a tough new rule, but, but you know, we're innovative. We're smart. We can figure it out. And maybe our competitors yeah. can't. And it gives them an opportunity to outmaneuver their competitors. And so they're not really doing anything. That is true. Well, that's a good time to segue into the four classes that I was going to ask you about. They were the agents and brokers. And so if I'm an agent, uh, a life insurance broker, and I'm making outgoing calls, you know, are brokers, are you at risk as a broker, as, a, as a, an agent calling? Is, are you at risk, first of all, and uh, at, on what level? How so? Absolutely. You're, you're at extreme risk. You are the one uh, in the front lines, right? Yep. You're the one who's actually making the call, and therefore you are the one who's going to be uh, initially liable to the plaintiffs uh, for the illegal call. And that doesn't matter if you know you tried in good faith to only call a valid lead, and your lead supplier, you know, either lied to you, screwed up, or didn't follow the new rule because they, they didn't have a lawyer that was good enough to do it. Um, so you've got to be really, really thoughtful about who you're buying leads from. Now, again, this new rule does not go into effect until January of 2025. Yep. So you've got time, right? Right now, and I know when I say that, like everyone's like, "Oh, okay, well then, I'll we'll deal with it in December." I know. Okay, you know, I know. Uh, do do you know, do as you see fit. But I'm telling you, January 2025 is going to be here pretty quick. Uh, and yeah. when it is, right, it's like a light switch. One day it was light, and the next day it's dark. So, so an agent. It being exposed, yes, and they're, they're unaware. Let me add this to the mix right here, too, because this is we, we, we put get a breakdown of the agents and their awareness. And without putting percentage on it, the majority of agents, they don't know anything about this. They don't know anything's even going on, truthfully. Um, yeah, you know, right and I was at a convention last month of all insurance agents. You would think that this topic would be bustling across right it would be non-stop chatter about this not once was it really even mentioned not once you know and it's a convention with carriers imos agents n not even i was i'm aware and i'm just listening uh i didn't bring it up a ton except for specific people because why would i break it right there you know what i mean they don't they don't seem to care for one so they're not going to care until it harms so but there's a small percentage who maybe have heard about it but they really don't know what to do, how to learn more, which is hence the podcast we're doing today is to try to get this out, get help, help them help them learn because they're seeking. But there's another small percentage that no, they don't care. They, they don't care. They're going to keep moving. They, they think it's not going to affect them. They're in that mode, right? So, you know, we, we can do some good here with this podcast for all these types, bringing awareness, you know, not necessarily to scare people, but to, to bring the awareness up. But why would they be scared? There's never been any cases that anyone knows about where an agent 
got in trouble with TCPA. I mean, I'm sure it goes on, but we, no one in the industry knows about it. Why? Oh, why would they stop? All the time. They get sued all the time. I mean, really? I had uh, my podcast deserved to win, um, which is a YouTube channel podcast you guys should check out. Uh, there was a guy yes. named uh, Robert Dolfka, and he got sued. He was an independent that was uh, selling to Allstate. Uh, and Allstate got sued. He got sued along with them. He had to lay off 12 people. He lost millions of dollars out of it. Um, it happens all the time. Man, this is not unusual. Really? Now, the truth is there's hundreds of thousands of independent agents, and there's only right. you know thousands of these lawsuits that are being brought, and only hundreds of them a year are against insurance agents. So you know, people are like, hey, I'm going to play my odds. Right. But you, you should not be foolish enough to think that you're not a potential target or that you're not liable. You are Thank right you. now, whether or not you get sued, that's a different issue. But you are but you are potentially liable. OK, well, how would they get caught? I mean, when they get caught, let's just say, especially with the new rulings and the new rule, you know, this it's it's more likely now. I, I've I've read a couple of articles. They expect this uh, the litigation to triple this this upcoming year, twenty twenty five, and I, I can see the numbers there. A major question that I keep getting: What is the FCC? What is the plaintiff's bar? What are what are they doing to catch these people? How are they catching them? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I know many agents, and I you know a lot of people are going to be angry with me for spilling some of this, but they're not using their phone number when they call. They may use their first name only. They actually describe the entity from which they're calling as, you know, they have the data in front. Of, they know what county that person's in. So they're like, this is me. I, I'm with, you know, such and such county benefit center. And so there's no way to track that person, even if that person said, you know, like they usually do, go to hell and don't call me back. So what, how are they going to catch them is the question that everybody has. Oh, trust me. You all are not as clever as you think you are. Um, so it's very straightforward, right? You want to get paid, don't you? How do you get paid? You get paid through attribution when you write a policy. Uh, so if I want to find the caller and I'm a, a guy that's wanting to sue you and you're hiding your identity and you're calling from a fake phone number, well, I guess I'll just go through your process and find out who the carrier is. And then what usually happens is they'll start off suing the carrier and then they'll tell the carrier, dear carrier, you tell us who made the phone call and we'll let you go. And you think the carrier cares enough That's about you, man. Mr. Agent, that they're not going to give you up? They'll give you sure. up in a heartbeat. They'll give you up in a heartbeat. <laughs> uh, and then now you're sued. Now you're found. Now you're caught. And now you have to answer for your illegal call, for your spoof phone number, for failing to disclose who you are. And every one of those calls now is not $500, which is the minimum violation for a single violation. But because each one of these phone calls now is four or five violations because you broke so many different rules, now you're looking at $2,500 a phone call. They'll subpoena all of your records. They'll get your carrier's records. Every outbound call you've made for a four-year period of time will now be at issue in that case. Uh, so, yeah, it's a big deal. Plus, you can't even use like a corporate LLC to protect yourself because in TCPA, there's personal liability, personal. individual liability. So they'll name you personally in the lawsuit uh, and you might lose your house. Like this is the way these things go. Uh, it's a terrible statute. It's very, very bad. It's very aggressively litigated. Again, people don't hear about it as much as they should uh, because the litigation uh, is not, I mean, truthfully, I, I think there's too much litigation, but yet compared to the number of violations there are, yeah. I mean, arguably there could be even more litigation, right? And that's what's so funny, you know, kind of like zooming out for a second. Yep. You know, the, the plaintiff's lawyers, um, you know, they focus so much on the wrong parties, in my view, because they want to get paid, Right. Uh, and they know that they, they spend a lot of time on the individual agents who might be the ones that are causing the trouble. You know, the agents many times aren't like super loaded, although some of them are, as you know, but many times they're not. And so they go after the brands more. Right. And and okay. because they're going after the brands, they bring low, uh, lower volumes of cases so they can focus their resources to really fight against the big whale. Yeah. Right. Whereas if they change their model and they were like, look, we're not going to fight against the big whale. We're just going to go and go, you know, take a net and catch all the tuna, uh, they could just really be wiping, just wiping out huge numbers of agents. Uh, they haven't done that yet, but that's something that, you know, you should keep in mind because that model could change at any moment. Uh, and then you could see a lot more of like the, you know, yeah. the, the shakedown extortionist lawsuits coming after the agents uh, rather than really just going after the whale. Yeah. See, I'm, I don't have many friends in that practice because uh, I don't, I won't do it. I, it didn't take me but uh, a handful of months. See, I left the corporate position uh, to come into personal finance. When I see for the first time how 
the the lead generation on top of that the the process of calling so many people and the practice they do i just couldn't do it uh, which is why I stepped out uh, or really stepped aside and started building a software that would do this legitimately, ethically. And mm-hmm. would you believe that the majority of these lead vendors, I say majority, all of them that I've experienced, I'm not going to say all, but uh, they won't provide the marketing to you. They won't show you what ads they run. Go watch the video that I published. You'll, you'll appreciate it. They right. won't show you the last. And that's and to me, that's the, the first red flag. In fact, I had two of them. As part of this video, I think you'd appreciate it. Part of this video, I, I called two of them, uh, major lead vendors, or at least the ones that are in the circle. I ordered uh, the fresh exclusive lead, and I said, okay, before you can launch the campaign, send me a copy. Send me a copy of the ads so I can prepare. As an agent, I would want to know that information. It's good for the script going to call this person, you know, whatever final yeah, service yeah. they need. I know how they got to me, right? And I know I even the lead form, how many copies of the lead form. Rather than do that, they refunded my money and said they wouldn't service me. <laughs> and this happened a number of times. I, the more I think about it, I'm going to send this video to you directly because it, it's all of it. And, and when we dug out the actual ad, because one of them did provide me with an ad, after I refused to do business with them anymore, um, <laughs> they sent me an ad, but it I ended up uncovering the real ad. So they sent me a fake one to get me to shut up, and it didn't. You, I, you'll appreciate the video. I'm gonna I'm gonna link it. You 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 especially of all. Yeah, I mean it's it. terrible the things that go on out there, like the creative. So I tell all my clients, like, look, you're a lead buyer. Um, you know, you've got to be responsible to understand who you're buying from, and it, that counts. You know, to look at the URLs. Uh, and go all the way down to the creatives. I mean, if it's a social media campaign, if it's, you know, a, an inbound campaign um, that you're paying for, you got to look at these creatives. You got to know what they're promising. And you've got a great point, right? It, it's not just for compliance purposes, although compliance purposes certainly matter. But how are you going to sell if you don't know what the <laughs> consumer's experience with the journey has exactly. been, right? You know, they're, they're looking at one thing that's kind of promising one thing. And then they come to you and you're talking about something totally different. They're like, no, no, dude, I'm here to, to hear about X. And you're talking about... W. Thank you. you. Know, Thank you. Best. And the, the trigger leads as well, where somebody will fill out a form and it might be in some way related to another product, the service. So they'll repurpose and sell that lead as another. Uh, it, it gets worse too when you look at, and I've been documenting this uh, for the last three or four months, and I'm going to publish a video on this expose as well, where I've got copies of these YouTube ads that are playing. It's about the the sixty four hundred dollars subsidy that they're offering. The lead ends up being sold to life insurance agents and and, and health insurance agents. Uh, but you know the purpose of the phone call is to get you know, or the purpose of filling out the form is to have the expectation of that government subsidy that doesn't even exist. So I'm I'm putting that together. A little teaser. I'm putting one together for that as well. I'm going to publish well, the and videos. That's, and, and that's them. actually another big change that we should talk about that I haven't mentioned yet, which is the logically and topically related rule. So the commission's put out a bunch of rules. We've only talked about yeah. really one. Um, and the logically and topically related rule uh, now requires that whatever the consent was, that whatever the transaction was that, that the consumer was interested in hearing about, yep. the calls are have to be limited to things that are logically and topically related to that content. So if you're not looking at the content, how can you possibly know if your calls are going to be logically and topically related to it? Agreed. It's a really big deal for lead buyers now because not just right is it a one to one rule. It's also a logical and topical consent scope rule that you need to be keeping in mind as well. Yeah. So so I was right. The lead the the lead vendors not handing out the marketing and disallowing you to even view their marketing content. Big red flag. So I I, I call that out quickly. Well, to to transition to uh, keep on the same topic, but transition to the second entity. What about IMOs? What what exposure are they having? You know, some of them provide leads to their agents. Some don't. In fact, the breakdown of them is 90 percent of the uh, IMOs or the uh, BGAs that we speak to. They don't know about this either. I've been the one to educate several of them. A few of them is going to watch this now. I know that I'm talking about them because I brought it up to them and I, I've, I've shared all this with them. So I've been educating IMOs. If they're not supplying leads, they don't even know about it. So they're exposed and don't know as well, we'll say. But what, what is flagged. the exposure to an IMO? Yeah, the, the exposure is very large to the IMO. The IMO's name is in all likelihood going to be in the email address of the agent, right? That, that's making the Good outbound point. calls. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're highly visible. Um, and you know, if they're selling, if they're providing the leads, obviously now they've got their fingerprints on the, the outbound call. 
Even if they're not providing the lead, though, there's going to be you know many instances where these guys are you know tacitly encouraging their agents to make outbound calls, even if they're not giving them the leads, right? And that's what you're going to be looking at. I mean, like there might be there might be um, some instances where the IMOs are like totally checked out. The agents are just doing what they're doing, and the IMO has no responsibility. Um, but mm, that's not going to happen very often. Uh, so you know the IMO networks need to be aware. I mean these these guys. Uh, are, are absorbing tremendous risk as as their affiliated agents are out there doing the things that they're doing, um, and they really need to be taking, you know, the steps to educate folks. I mean, they should really be on the front lines talking to their people. Reminds why me is it? Of, why is it ahead. you think they're not? Because well, I've been think, saying this. Well, well, so I think some of them aren't educated; they just don't know. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of echoes to the. Um, the real estate broker context uh, in the real estate brokerage context, right? They follow like a franchise model or an independent agent model by and large. Uh, and so you might have a big brand like Caldwell Banker, uh, but you know, nobody actually works for Caldwell Banker. All of the agents assigned are just licensees of the name Caldwell Banker. Right. Uh, and Caldwell Banker likes to keep it that way. And there's actually incentives in the law for them not to have too much control over their franchisees, over their agents. Right. Uh, and so they do very little, um, you know, setting policies, procedures, you know, you know, they don't exercise much control. Uh, and as a result, right, they don't necessarily even know what their agents are doing. And they feel for other laws that this is good for them. But with the TCPA, it's bad for them because the courts don't care, right? The courts don't care if you're an independent contractor or if you're an employee. The courts don't care. They're going to find you liable if you fail to take steps appropriate to keep your agents under control. Uh, and so I think it's the same sort of thing, right? There's just this mindset that, hey, these are independent agents. You don't want to be controlling them. Obviously, obviously, if they're your employees, you got to be controlling them. You've got to be giving them. Right. Training. But yeah. I think in many instances, because folks are independent, uh, you know, the IMOs are like, hey, look, you know, that's not what we do. We don't, we don't control people. We don't tell them what to do or how to do it. So why okay. would we take any steps to educate? But the answer is because you know, the TCPA is different. It's just a different animal. It's not like any other law. Like you can be liable uh, for not controlling. Whereas in most instances, you're only liable if you do control. Interesting. So the IMO, it might, is it possible that the agent say gets, gets reported, they, they do their investigation, the plaintiff's part that is, does their investigation and they come up with the IMO, then they tie in the carrier I mean, who's is any of them getting out of it, we'll say, or can they sell each other down? Does it roll downhill like every other shit? Or is this uh, which one's going to take the blunt? The, the brunt it, just of the, depend, the it depends on the plaintiff's lawyer. I mean, everyone in the chain is at risk, ironically, except for the data broker. Right. Ironically, that's the irony. Um, really? and we'll talk about that here in a second. OK. Uh, but yeah, so the, the agent, the IMO, the carrier, all of them are visible. All of them are in the chain of the call. Uh, and all of them are likely to be sued. Uh, now, depending on the plaintiff's lawyer and their philosophy, sometimes, as I told you earlier, right, the carrier will get let go because the hardest case is the case against the carrier. It, it's hard for them to pierce that those levels to get all the way to the carrier when the carrier had nothing to do with the phone call. They True. didn't know the phone call was being made. You know, they they're just here to to write a policy that's being sold. That's it. And they right? they put in their language too, their compliance language that. Any marketing used to get to this product should has to be reviewed by us. It's never done, but that's their language that gives them the out as well. Well, that actually gets them in trouble. If they're saying it can be reviewed, then that actually will be a level of control that would actually the plaintiff's lawyers would like that. But so if it wasn't reviewed, is, if they can prove that it wasn't reviewed by them, is that good or bad for them? Well, so if if the the rule is right, if you're a carrier and you are just writing policies, um, then your position has to be, you know, you, agent, you follow all laws in connection with your behavior. And we assume mm -hmm. that you follow all laws in connection with your behavior. You don't work for us. You don't even, you know, we, we're, we're just buying, buying, you know, writing, writing paper, basically, That's is right. all we're doing. Um, and so under the law, it's actually hard to go after somebody um, like the carrier in this context. It's not impossible. Some lawyers have done it and they've done it successfully. But like I said, that's like the big whale, right? Right. Um, and 
many and many lawyers will they'll go after the whale they don't care they're going to go after the whale they're going to get that whale you know they're going to shoot as many harpoons into it as they have to and they're going to bring it down um but other lawyers are like i'm going to let the whale go we've got plenty of other fish over here that we're going to go after uh and that's what i'm saying like the whale is going to be visible the carrier you know the, the person who wants to sue is going to have that name and they sue that name and then they basically just let them go let that whale go and they just give up you know, the, the carrier gives up everybody in the chain. Uh, so everybody so, else ends up in the lawsuit. Uh, and so that's, that's what that's, that's a good rule of thumb. I'm going to use that analogy going forward. The smaller the fish, it's easier for the plaintiff ball to reel it in. That's right. So that's the way it's going to be. That's a, that's a fact. I'm going to stick to that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to that and share that a lot. So, 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 so even at the carrier level though, um, how should they be responding right now, in your opinion, to all the way down through their IMOs and agents? They, I mean, they got to be communicating with the IMOs, in my view. I, I don't know if they go all the way to the agent level, um, but to me, you know, they, they've got to be putting out bulletins and advisories because they're going to get picked apart. They're going to they get do. picked apart. I've received from four different carriers in the last, uh, since January, since after the December ruling, I've received four bulletins. And I see some updates to their compliance manuals as well, but it's mainly just you have to follow TCPA. They're not being specific, but I've seen four carriers send out bulletins. But other than that, I've heard nothing else. Yeah, well, they should they should be more active, is, is my opinion. Now, you know, they all have their own in-house legal departments. Everybody's going to be vetting these things their own way. But as you said, I mean, the one thing that everyone has to be prepared for is these lawsuits tripling. Um, I mean, it, it is it, it is crazy what's about to happen. Um, and it's like the, and the only limiting factor on the number of lawsuits is going to be is, you know, there's just not that many plaintiffs lawyers that specialize in this. Uh, and that's the only reason why you're not going to see 500,000 lawsuits next year. Um, you're only going to see probably 12,000 lawsuits. And it's just because there's only so many lawyers that really do this kind of work. What's going to get these agents, uh, what's, what's the best activity? I say that facetiously, that's going to get an agent called out. I'm surely once every now and then, or no, how is the consumer? That big question I get asked is what is the FCC doing to alert the consumer that, Hey, we now have these laws, these people that are blowing up your phone, you can take them down, whatever, however they want to market that. Are they going to do anything to notify the public? And how is the, and otherwise, how would the public find out? Well, the FCC does very little of that. The public finds out the way that you'd expect them to find out. The big plaintiff's lawyers are out there on a bulletin board Okay. Or on a commercial saying, That's hey, good. did you receive unwanted calls? Did you know you can get up to $1,500 for one of those? You know, reach out now and we'll bring your lawsuit. Yeah. Morgan and Morgan or, you know, who any of these, these guys are. Um, and, and they do a ton of that. They, they gin up thousands okay. of these lawsuits. Um, and, you know, again, so you ask me, what, like, what's, what's the number one activity that'll get you in trouble? Using pre-recorded calls or voicemails or AI channel outreach. That is going to get you sued. Okay. That's the first. I, I don't see you. that often. Like I really, I've never seen that in any of the people that's, that I'm close with. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I've never seen that one. Um, but like I said, if it's out there, that, that makes sense. That's, that's too much automation. What's the next one? Maybe these auto dollars? Like what, what's the next? The auto dollars would be, your, would be your next level of risk. That's correct. Uh, blast text messaging is, is a risk. Auto dialers is a risk. Um, and then, you know, there's certain high risk states. Uh, that you're more likely to get sued in like Florida, Oklahoma, Maryland. Um, so if you're in one of those states, you've got to be extra careful because there's a state level on top of the federal level. Florida, um, Maryland, and where? Oklahoma, randomly. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Didn't see that coming. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, what exactly did plaintiff's bar get to? Let's say an, an, an agent gets reported. Is it going to be a regular occurrence that has to trigger to get them, or is it just one time can get them? One time. One time. Okay. So let's just say that they're that random person who gets it. The plaintiff bar responds. What do they get out of it? What is the consumer that filed the complaint? What do they get out of the lawsuit? And what does the plaintiff bar get for just a phone call from a single agent? Well, it depends how it goes, right? <laughs> so so a couple there's a couple of different ways, right? The 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 best way, right, that you'd hope for if you're an agent is you know, one guy sues you over one phone call. And it's, you know, 500 bucks, 1500 bucks, 2500 bucks, just depending on how many rules are violated with the one phone call. Unfortunately, that almost never happens, right? First of all, you're probably going to call that guy more than once. Um, but more importantly, right. the, the plaintiff's bar is not out here to, to eat $5,000 or $2,500 at a time, right? They're out here to, to eat. That's to what I was getting at. Yeah. And so they will sue what's, what's called a class action. 
right? And so it's not just that one call that you made, it's every single call you've made to anybody, right? Using the same process that you used to call that one person. So let's say you've got a campaign and your campaign is, you know, I know you say most people don't use pre-recorded voicemails, but let's right. just say you're using a ringless voicemail or something yes. and you're going to buy, you know, a thousand leads a day and leave, you know, a thousand ringless voicemails. And, and that's what your plan is, right? Well, it, you know, one guy gets one ringless voicemail and he goes to the law firm and says, I'm going to sue for this. Well, now he's going to have to just sue for his one call. He's going to sue for everybody that you left a ringless voicemail for a thousand a day going back four years. Four, um, it's four so years retro? Four years retro, guys. Four years. So you make one mistake today, they can go all the way back to 2020 on you. Right. And they'll pull phone records and data records, any kind of subscription you may have to these ringy, you know, messaging campaigns. They can pull it all back. And if you didn't have consent and all this in place, they can retro four years on you. That's Never, where the money comes in. That's where their incentive comes in. That's what I was looking for. It's not just right. a single. And so, and so these guys. So now if you're doing a thousand a day, right, that's a minimum five hundred thousand dollars a day in liability. Right. And you go back a week. Now you're at two and a half million and you go back a month. Now you're at 10 million. Right. And you go back 24 months and now you're at a quarter of a billion dollars. I mean, none of you have a quarter billion dollars. No. Right. And that's and it's that's personally personally liable too, right? Correct. Correct. That's what I'm saying. These are the biggest lawsuits, the biggest trap lawsuits that, that you could ever imagine in the world. And that's why I've dedicated my practice to helping to protect people. But, you know, we only help to protect people who try to protect themselves. Right. Like right. If, if you are somebody that wants to comply with the law, you know, we help people to understand the law. We help people to comply with the law and we stand behind our clients. But if you're someone that just, yeah, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And then, you know, you get sued one day and you come and what's that old line to don't come crying to me, right? You, you come and call me and say, Mr. Czar, please protect me. Odds are pretty slim that I can do anything about it, right? Like you, you've gone and you got yourself into that trouble. And if you don't at least have policies, if you don't at least have yourself in a position to be able to defend your conduct, then, I mean, it really can be very bad in these cases, like really bad. Wow. See, and that's, that's where it is. And this next little topic ties right in. Age leaves. That's, that's what's going to get them. Like the, the, the call practice, yes, how they're calling, how they're messaging, that's going to get them hemmed up. And the second component here, the age leaves now being technically noncompliant. Uh, that's that's going to get them. That's another way to get them hemmed up. There's multiple layers here to get hemmed up is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so age leaves, that's confirmed, noncompliant. Is that as of January 25th, upcoming 25? That is correct. January 2025, just get that light switch. Remember, the mm -hmm. lead that you bought on January 26th, 2025 will be legal. But if you call it again the next day on January 27th, 2025, it is now illegal. Simple as that. Can you obtain a written consent through text? If you you reach that individual, say it's January 26th next year, you reach mm -hmm. that person. Because I remember prior written consent, I did a video on this, the ways that consent is obtained. You know, the they hand it to you. They can give you direct consent and they can, and that was face to face to give you their number. That was a consent measure. Unless they've changed this definition since I did the video. And then they can give you... Uh, the the express written consent which by some means of sending them a message and then replying yes or something like that can you collect their consent on that first phone call uh, i mean they're giving you consent anyways i know the, the the probability of them being the ones to report you is low when they're they're communicating with you regularly but i'm looking at tcpa it doesn't care right so can, how can you log consent uh after that lead form to continue yeah, so it's actually a really interesting question. So your question is like you're going to take a non-conforming age lead and try to turn it into. Uh, well, a lead no, that's not really. I, only leads I work with, yes, only leads I work with is compliance, uh, like consent recorded and stored. But I'm saying if there is an age lead from the past and they call them, is can they somehow work up a new consent? Yeah, as long as it's before January 27th of 2025. Yes. Interesting. That that's neat, uh, but 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 as a, a a vendor, a lead vendor, data vendor, whatever supplier you want to call these these lead guys, they can no longer sell them because consent was only given to that first individual, and there's no way to resell it legally from January well, 26 forward, right? Well, they can sell it. They can sell it all they want. Oh, well. But if you but if you buy it, it's wor it's worthless. You just bought something that's not worth a penny. Really? You just can they get in trouble for selling it? Uh, depends on their contract, right? They can't get in trouble with the FCC or the plaintiff's bar, 
But if they sell something, their contract says, you know, it has to be a compliant lead and they sell a non-compliant lead, then the lead buyer could sue the lead seller. Um, but I mean, that's not uh... much of a risk, right? So it's the same problem that we have today where the incentives on the data broker are not to be compliant. It's, you know, the risk is not on them. The risk is on the lead buyer. It's, it's caveat emptor. Buyer beware, buddy. That you know, is weird. Do you think that would change? Because if if you're going to make your the product that somebody produces, you're going to make it non-compliant, but they can't get in trouble for continuing to generate non-compliance. How could they be missing the liability there? Oh, well, I mean, it's just like the gun manufacturers, right? In California, you're not allowed to have a huge banana clip, but you know what? The gun manufacturer can make all they want. And if you're dumb enough to buy it, you're the one that's in trouble, not the gun manufacturer. <sighs> that's how it is. And it's the same sort of thing, right? These guys are selling a product that is illegal. Uh, and, you know, in the, in the, in the drug, war on drugs, right? You go after the drug manufacturer, you go after the drug dealer. In this yeah. world, they're going after the drug user, right? You're going, they're wow. going after the lead buyer. And everybody else in the chain is safe. That's another analogy I'm going to have to hang on to. They're not going after the dealer. They're going after the user in this case. That's, what, that's exactly right. That's, that's the clo- to me, that's the closest analogy. And these, you know, these lead sellers, you know, they, they even analogize themselves, you know, to being drug dealers. I mean, they, they, they'll, they'll wink at it at some, in some of their content they put out, you know, like, oh, I got the good stuff. Like, I'm that's really right. Sell you something good. I mean, they really play into it so, to a certain degree. And it's truer than it should be, you know, uh, but the That's buyers right. have to be, you know, they have to not just be addicts, right? Edu- they have education, be- agent education is critical. That's what this podcast was done, why we did this. And this is going to have to keep moving forward uh, it, with, with more and more education because they're walking into something they don't know. And the lead vendors, the, it's the, the dirty lead vendors are, you know, they almost like they have a, a weird exemption now too. And then the ones that are not the ones that are doing consent practices as they should, they have to keep it recorded and readily available too, right? That consent no. has to be recorded and kept. How's that? Not, not anymore. The lead buyer has to have the possession of the record. Which so, would come from the lead generator though, right? Is that, right. So when okay. you're buying a lead, you can no longer rely on the lead seller to record and maintain. You as a lead buyer have to take possession of it and you have to maintain it. Of what form? Like ours, I'm going to tell you, ours, in a, it sends the lead to the, the agent, and it has in the column, did this person consent? And it's the answer they gave, yes. Of course, they, it's a mandatory consent, so it's always going to say yes. But what other forms of proof would be required for that agent to hang on to? Well, the truth is no one knows because it's a brand, <laughs> new, brand new rule. But I would say you want to have a picture of the website, you want to have, uh, you know, some form of a data element that tells you exactly what the consumer saw and not just the content of the language. That matters, too. But if you're going to try to enforce it, you've got to have the entire picture of what it looked like for a court uh, to accept that this was a valid online web form submission. Uh, just like you'd want a scanned piece of paper for the mm-hmm. contract, right, if somebody signed and not just, you know, the, the language that was on the contract. You want to actually see the contract, right? That's it's right. The same thing with a web form submission. Uh, so you've got to, you know, either have your uh, lead seller provide you with that, or mm-hmm. of course, there's companies like Active Prospect and Jernia that have third-party witness software that can actually give you a visual rendering of the entire web session where the consumer is like moving their mouse around and like entering information on the web. So you can actually see that, and that's actually something that is provided out there by these services. That's good. That, that's just super interesting. What What about this next topic? Uh, live transfer. Same story. Same case. It's the same thing. They can't. They, they might be non-compliant or they might be compliant, depending on if the other <laughs> rules are followed. So, right. for instance, if you are, um, I mean, it's going to be very, very hard for an agent, right, to, to yeah. get a, a, tra- a valid transfer. Because, again, the consumer would have to sign up for a carrier, right? And then the caller would have to be calling essentially on behalf of the carrier to get the consumer on the line to transfer to you as the agent who could only sell the carrier, right? So it would have to be a complete alignment from the original creative all the way through to the carrier with everybody in between serving as just the go-between for the carrier. The end product would dictate even the marketing form. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely All the way, man. Do you think the plaintiff's bar would ever see it with that selling the services, like the financial service being the product? Do you ever think they'll ever revise 
and catch and you know, start seeing it that way instead? It's a good, it's a, the courts are going to have to weigh in on that. Um, but the safer you can make yourself, the clearer you can make yourself, right, yeah. as an agent that you're providing that service, that you're providing that advisory, and that is what the consumer is going to receive a phone call about, the better off you'll be. Awesome. That's 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 amazing. Even SOC 2, was that in a way that it gave you some uh, – any no, kind of league way, any better? All. Yeah, no, data compliance, InfoSec, none of that matters in this context. We're just looking at TCPA. Got it. I think what we came here to do is is, is happened um, to bring awareness and didn't mean to scare the entire industry, but it kind of it's kind of getting there. They need to be a little scared. It seems. Well, I mean, you know, people people talk about fear all the time, and I I don't think of it as as fear. I just think of it as like, look, man, you, you're engaging in conduct. There's only one law that really applies to you when you're talking about outbound calling, and it's the yeah. TCPA. It's just like anything else. You're an insurance yeah, broker. You know, you, like insurance requirements, the law of insurance applies to you. So like, you're not afraid of that. You just know you have to comply with it, right? It's the same thing with, with the telemarketing laws. Like it's nothing to be afraid of. It's just, you have to understand this is the law and you have to follow it just like any other law. Uh, and then once you're empowered and you're educated and you know about it, it's actually not that big of a deal. Um, you know, sure. it's not as if it can't be complied with. Well, as I told you, it is tricky for brokers right now with the language that the FCC used, and that needs to be adjusted. But outside of that issue, you know, once you understand the rules, you you can comply, assuming you've got the right partners. And that's the issue, right. you know, that you started with and that will end with is the real issue is the divide between the lead buyers who need to be educated and buy only valid leads and the lead sellers who are not incentivized under the new rule to really obey the right. rule. They, sure. They're incentivized to sell as much as they can still and basically trick lead buyers into buying garbage. Um, and, and that's why the REACH membership, again, which is so invaluable because REACH members, you know, are held to the highest standards uh, as lead sellers. Uh, and so you don't have to be as worried when you're buying a, a lead from a REACH, uh, a REACH member. Uh, so that's really something to think about. That's that's very good. And, and I personally gonna will, will promote that as well. You know, I came into this industry, like I said, from from a. I was corporate finance, stepping into personal finance was a, a transition within itself. But uh, I didn't come in thinking I'd get involved in trying to clean up some of the, you know, the malfeasance here, we'll call it. Um, but and I'm still don't see it like I really am in like I haven't tasked myself in cleaning up the industry in any way. But I, I guess I would look at it like I'm trying to do my part by offering programs that are better and are compliant and ethical, especially uh, that doesn't create those issues so that maybe that's my way of helping and contributing to the cleanup. Just final words out to, to agents, IMO and carriers. And, and of course the lead as well, your final words, if you were going to throw out your ending here to, to, to warn them properly, uh, what, what would you say to, to the groups? I just understand the law has changed. You've got to educate yourself. You've got that responsibility. There is no, you know, not knowing the law is not a defense and you work too hard to create your business to see everything go down the drain because of a phone call, right? Just do it the right way. That's it. Simple as that. It's awesome stuff. I've really enjoyed this podcast. Like I'm, I'm very grateful you came on and, and to share this. I think you're doing a, a very good thing. Like you're, you're, you're amazing at what you're, you're getting involved in and how you, you've found your way in this space and, and you're, you're owning it. So I, I can say I can't tell you how grateful I am. And as these things develop, you're you're welcome to come back on and we'll we'll keep some updates for the for the especially the insurance industry is where I'm providing most information. Uh lead generation as well. Um but yeah, if you're willing to come on and let's keep people updated as the as it develops, uh, you're absolutely welcome to come on. Let's do that and continue. But uh, that's this has been amazing, and I, I really grateful you came on, took the time to share this with us. I'm, I think we're going to do a lot of good with this podcast. Wonderful. Well, pleasure to be Great here. Job. Good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye.